we're a unique group in that we take a holistic approach to protecting the Bay and the Gulf of Maine. Uh, and we do that through research advocacy. Uh, we are a land trust and we have an active education program, <clears throat> considerably more active before COVID hit. So this is part of it, but uh, with education, we, we have a history of doing a lot with kids in elementary schools, um, focusing on hands-on work, uh, either in school or at a couple of times a year. We have a bay day where they're out in the field getting muddy and counting plants and looking at birds and uh, doing real archaeology digs and stuff. So we hope to get back to that at some point. Um, some examples of research. We've done a very extensive circulation study of the bay. That was a four-year study. Uh, the bay is a very complicated soup bowl with a very narrow entrance or exit uh, via the Kennebec River. Six rivers joining the bay uh, and uh, draining about 40% of Maine. So we learned a lot from that. We've looked at um, historical data uh, using historical aerial photography, looking at vegetation and land use changes over time. And we continue to do updates on that. Um, we've done some great archaeology. I don't know when I got muted, Martha. I didn't do anything. Uh, We've done some great archaeology is where you left off. Say again? We've done some great archaeology. So I st I'm still not, not understanding you. Sorry about that. But we're a uh, uh, land. We do land conservation work. We're a land trust. We've protected about 1,500 acres of land around the bay um, and uh, about 11, 12 miles of shoreline. Most recently, Centers Point, with the help of the Maine Coast Heritage Trust, the largest unprotected piece of land uh, on the bay, and that's in Bodenham, uh, abutting a wildlife management area and abutting easement land we have. And we've done some great advocacy over the years uh, and currently working again on trying to upgrade the lower Androscoggin River from a class C, which is the lowest grade possible with the state, to a class B, which is where the data have, have um, told us it's testing at for years. And uh, this will be a great thing if we could do it this year. We upgrade because once you upgrade, there's really, it's very difficult to backslide. Got to go through a big, big stink with the EPA to do that. And this would be a good year to do it being the 50th anniversary of, of Muskie's uh, Clean Water Act. And uh, for those that don't know it, the Andrew Scoggin was the poster child for that act. So it would, it would be a fitting kind of bookend for that. We're also in the middle of a lawsuit um, uh, against Central Maine Power uh, for the uh, unnecessary tower lighting out at the chops where the bay empties out and, and as, a, as a partial alternative to lighting, uh, inundating everyone with radio frequency radiation. That again is unnecessary totally. So we're bringing the suit under nuisance law. Uh, we do a lot with fish passage as well and have had various lawsuits dealing with that over the years. So much of what we do has to do with or is possible because of volunteers. So if you're not a member, uh, please consider joining us and uh, you know volunteering for some aspect of what we do. Uh, we actually need uh, two or three water quality monitors for this next season. Um, so that would be really a, a, a quick, uh, quick jump into my mind uh, need of ours. Um, so in Bath and in up in the Gardner and Hollowell area. All right, without further ado, uh, our speaker tonight, Doug Bogan, is executive director of the Seacoast Anti-Pollution League, which I hope he'll say a few words about. Um, Doug's been an environmental organizer and advocate for over 30 years uh, with his expertise in the field of environmental science and education. Uh, his, his extensive knowledge of the history of the energy industry and a comprehensive understanding of the regulatory processes uh, Doug's able to develop real world community based solutions to our most challenging environmental issues. Uh, in addition to his work at the Seacoast League, Doug's a founding member of the Seacoast Peace Response and Portsmouth, yeah, Severodvinsk uh, connection, so Russian sister city, I'm going to guess. Um, he was program director of the Seacoast Area Renewable Energy Initiative 
2011 to May 2016. Uh, and from 1991 to 2009, Doug worked with Clean Water Action's New Hampshire program, where he served as their state program director for most of that time. His work there included cleaning up the state's old fossil fuel power plants, combating climate disruption, drinking water protection, coastal water quality efforts, and addressing toxic contamination, particularly mercury and military waste. Doug has also served since 1995 as co-chair of the Restoration Advisory Board for the Superfund Mitigation of Toxic Waste Sites at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. And Doug holds a Master's of Science in Environmental Education from Cornell and a BS in Biology from Colorado. Doug, welcome and thanks again so much for being here. Yes, thank you, Ed. Hope everybody can hear me well. Um, and I wanna thank uh, Friends of Mary Meeting Bay for inviting. Uh, we'd hoped to do this early last year, but uh, it did get delayed. So I'm glad we were able to uh, fit it in in the new year. Um, I realized in that intro, I didn't say much at all about Seacoast Anti Pollution League or my work with SAPL. Um, the SAPL has actually uh, just celebrated its 50th anniversary, it dates back to 1969. I like to say it's older than the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and as you might guess, it got started when Seabrook was uh, originally announced. I'll say a little more about that later. Um, but I've been with uh, SAPL for 20 years uh, on the board and 10 years about as the uh, director. Um, and I've been involved in nuclear issues for 45 years, I think, since I was in high school, uh, got involved. Um, so I've been following it for a long time and gathered a lot of info. Um, this talk tonight is uh, meant to be kind of an overview of uh, many of the issues uh, with Seabrook and nuclear power in general. Um, I don't pretend to be able to cover everything and, and obviously can't go into a great amount of depth. Um, uh, so I hope you'll bear with me. Um, uh, we won't be able to get to all the details, but I hope I can at least uh, pique your interest um, and uh, have some good follow up afterward. Um, so I'll begin with the slides here. Um, just a few basics on nuclear power. Um, for those who aren't that familiar with the history, uh, nuclear power really began as a byproduct of the nuclear weapons development um, at the end of World War II. And in fact, many of our nuclear plants are actually built on the same model as um, uh, military uh, reactors that ended up going into submarines and aircraft carriers and so forth. Um, Nuclear power has been in commercial operation for over 60 years now, um, and it is has received hundreds of billions of dollars in federal and state subsidies. Uh, there are efforts right now to increase many of those subsidies at the state level uh, to keep plants going. I'll talk about that a bit more later, um, but suffice to say, it's it's really uh, done very well on the federal dole, and uh, a lot of us think that's that's gone on long enough. Um, there are just less than 100 reactors. I believe we're down to 96 now in the country, and they uh, power less than 20% of the U.S. grid, just uh, less than one-fifth of all our power sources. Um, and they've generated over 80,000 tons of spent fuel. This is the high-level radioactive waste that must be kept uh, isolated for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and we add 2,000 tons each year. Uh, and, and of course, there is no long-term solution as we speak. Um, I like to present things in terms of problems and solutions. It's my training as a grassroots activist. Um, uh, in the case of Seabrook and nuclear, there are uh, many problems, uh, as you might guess. Uh, and I'll, I just want to walk through, uh, I think, about nine of them here tonight. Uh, the first one is a more general problem and I think is a very important point that our, our overall problem with our society is, is not just you know climate change or nuclear weapons, nuclear uh, issues, uh, but uh, that we have an unsustainable energy system. Um, and uh, that's kind of a big word, but it basically means we've been reliant on fossil fuels, on uh, materials that are dug up out of the um, and it's just not sustainable. 
um, obviously leads to climate disruption, um, air pollution, uh, fuel, um, and uh, even with you know nuclear, we have limits to how much uranium. They're not making any more of it. Uh, in a sense, it's a fossil fuel. Um, and of course, we have old efficient power plants uh, that uh, will one way or another need to be replaced. And lastly, I just I like to point out that we have what we call fossilized thinking. Um, a lot of people, you know, cut their teeth back in the 1960s and 70s. The older folks, uh, it's hard to change. Um, and what we're being required to do now is change our whole system as well as our way of thinking. Uh, just a note on the photo, uh, in the picture there, that's uh, actually a coal power plant. This is a Merrimack Station in Bow. Um, this is the other bad actor in New Hampshire, uh, largest source of carbon emissions in, in the state. Um, it's hopefully on its last legs, but it is still the last running coal plant in New England without any plan to retire as of yet. Uh, but folks are working on that. Now, um, getting more specifically to nuclear power, um, one huge problem is, as I've suggested, many of them are uh, getting quite antiquated. Um, and uh, they are dirty, despite all the hype about nuclear being clean power. Uh, it really isn't, um, even if you're talking about carbon emissions, but uh, suffice to say that there are many other sources of pollution. Um, we're dealing with an aging infrastructure. Most of the plants in the country are over 30 years old. Many of them are over 40 years old, and there's a few that are actually uh, over 50 years old. Um, we have routine radiation. It's not that well known, but every nuclear plant has to emit uh, radioactive gases so it doesn't blow up, uh, so it doesn't uh, leak uncontrollably. Um, and uh, also uh, solid waste and uh, liquid waste emissions. Um, there is no waste solution, as I mentioned before. Um, they are threatened by the climate as it is changing, especially plants like Seabrook pictured here that's on the seacoast, of course. Uh, many others are on lakes and reservoirs and rivers that are also uh, impacted, of course, by climate changes. Um, nuclear power is too expensive. I'll have a lot more to say a little later about that. Um, but suffice to say, it's, it's proven to be more expensive than originally advertised. And um, not least, uh, th there is the potential for cat catastrophe. It may be very low, may never happen here in the US, but we all know that we've had several very serious reactions around the world, which I'll talk some about in a minute. Um, and uh, in relation to those uh, accidents, we don't have a safe evacuation plan. Um, they do draw up plans, um, but uh, they, they are still to be determined if they'll even work in any basic level. So I'll be talking a lot more about each of these issues as we go along. Um, now, one key issue with plant aging, and this is an effect with all infrastructure, not just nuclear plants, um, is that uh, over time, they, they have a uh, pattern of, of breakdown or problems that, that represents uh, kind of a bathtub shape. As you can see on the diagram here, um, on the uh, horizontal axis is time, the vertical axis is uh, uh, frequency of failure. Um, and what we found with nuclear as well as other uh, infrastructure is that um, during the breaking in period as the plant or, you know, your car or whatever uh, is, is uh, getting uh, worn in, um, there's more likely to be problems, um, things need to be rejiggered, so forth. And at the tail end of the uh, time, uh, of course, as the plant ages, there's also more likely to be breakdowns. And not surprisingly, most of the serious actions we've had in this country and elsewhere in the world occurred somewhere on this bathtub scale. So you have Three Mile Island um, on the uh, left side here. Um, it was only three months old when it uh, had its catastrophic failure. Chernobyl wasn't much older than that. Um, and then on the other side, um, these other plants in the US have had serious accidents. Davis Bessie actually had a corrosion in the the top of the reactor that, that came very, very close to actually blowing a hole in the head of the reactor, if you can believe it. Um, and then um, even further off this, at the end of the uh, right side, 
um, is the Fukushima uh, reactors. The reactor one, the first one to melt down there, um, was just about 40 years old when that accident occurred. Um, so this is a, a common uh, problem uh, with plants. And um, it's a serious issue, of course, as these plants age. Um, another serious problem that you perhaps have heard about, if you've been following Seabrook at all, is this issue of uh, concrete degradation, or ASR, alkali silica reaction. And uh, this is due to the structure of the concrete itself. Um, evidently, they didn't use the right kind of aggregate in making the concrete for the plant. Uh, it's a long sorted story, but uh, suffice to say that uh, the plant owners and regulators realized uh, when they were relicensing the plant that these micro cracks were developing in the concrete itself. And um, this does appear to be associated with water seepage, uh, which um, is a problem with all concrete, but certainly with a nuclear plant where you have lots of water involved. Um, and the fact that the plant is underground as much as it is above ground. If you look at this diagram here, it doesn't really show uh, to scale or, or certainly in terms of Seabrook, there's as much uh, depth underground as there is above. And um, in, in the case of Seabrook, it's four or five stories of underground uh, structures uh, in the foundations that are subject to exposure with groundwater. Um, that's a long story in itself. Um, but it, it, it has led to this problem and other related problems with water seepage. Um, and it requires careful monitoring uh, and it worsens over time. Uh, so um, another organization we're allied with, uh, Citizens Within 10 Mile Radius or C10, they uh, intervened formally as a legal process with the NRC and the plant owner Next Era to uh, get uh, something done about this ASR problem beyond what uh, the NRC was uh, requiring NextEra to do, um, and it was a long process, uh, many years of uh, waiting, and they finally got their hearing, um, and there were some changes made to the process. Um, they are going to have to monitor it more often, but unfortunately for us anyway, it didn't stop the process. It didn't stop the re uh, licensing of the plant. Um, it remains to be seen whether it stops the plant itself, because they don't really have a plan B. Um, and uh, it, it could uh, be a, a long road for uh, them as this ASR problem continues. Um, another uh, issue with uh, uh, aging is, as I said, the uh, plants don't often hold up as long as they were uh, designed to. Uh, this list here is just a partial list of all the plants that didn't make it to the 40 year design life uh, what their uh, licenses uh, allowed for. Um, you'll notice uh, at the top of the list are four of the uh, nine uh, original reactors for uh, New England, uh, Connecticut Yankee, Millstone One, Maine Yankee, of course, and Yankee Row in Western Massachusetts. Um, all these plants, uh, as you can see, died before um, reaching 40. Uh, some didn't even reach 30. And um, there were fairly predictable reasons why that happened. Um, they'll always say it's due to cost, due to economics, but it's usually because something broke and it just cost too much to fix it. In the case of Maine Yankee, the reactor uh, vessel itself became so brittle that they were concerned that it wouldn't hold up in an accident. Um, and so it, it died uh, quite a few years prematurely. All in all, there's, uh, I counted 23 reactors around the country that uh, uh, expired prior to their 40-year uh, uh, lifespan. And um, it works out that of all the plants built uh, prior to 1973, fully half of them, 50% of those plants, didn't make it to 40 years. Um, I'm sure the, the industry will tell you that the, they're doing them better now. They're building them safer. Um, but this is a common problem. And uh, it's, it's something that uh, you have to be concerned about. Um, another uh, huge problem, of course, what I think most people relate to is human health impacts, uh, not surprisingly. Um, the issue of radiation exposure, of course, is, is very uh, uh, concerning, very fraught and controversial. Um, I always like to remind people that the National Academy of Sciences, our premier science 
body in the US uh, determined that there is no safe level of radiation. Um, this was uh, determined about 15 years ago, um, but a lot of people still don't seem to buy it. Um, and so it means that any additional radiation you get can increase your chances of getting cancer or other uh, health effects. Another big issue is that the long-term exposures uh, to these uh, nu nu nuclear ra radio nuclides um, is not well known. Um, there have been some studies uh, both here in the US and in, in uh, uh, Europe uh, that did determine that there were statistically significant increases in leukemia in particular, childhood cancers, other uh, uh, cancers. Um, but uh, it really hasn't been adequately studied considering we've had you know 50 some years to to uh, study the problem. Um, another issue that we, we've identified on the seacoast here is that um, where Seabrook is located, that uh, county and the surrounding counties have seen higher cancer rates since the plant was built. And you know this is a correlation. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the cause, um, but it is uh, certainly cause for concern. We saw a 20% increase in cancer rates from the 1980s to the 1990s and 2000s. Um, the plant was started in 1990. And um, we've also seen other data that shows a, an increase in the rate of childhood cancers in particular um, around the plant. Now the headline you see there on the screen, that was actually from a uh, cancer uh, study that was done just a few years ago in, two, in 2016 it was determined that there was a statistically significant cancer cluster right in the seacoast area, kind of centered on Rye, New Hampshire, if you know the neighborhood, um, and half a dozen surrounding towns. And these are for childhood cancers, very rare cancers that shouldn't be showing up as often. Um, to this date, there have been uh, a couple of different commissions put together to study it, but um, they have not determined uh, really what the cause was. Uh, but certainly Seabrook is a, a, a possible suspect um, given that there has been routine radiation exposure. Um, another problem, of course, is environmental impacts to the non-human biota out there. Um, huge issue in itself, but I just present you uh, one bit of data. This is from the uh, environmental impact statement uh, just a few years ago in the relicensing of the plant. Um, they uh, have been carefully tabulating all the fish kills that occur uh, when the plant is uh, sucking in water from the Atlantic Ocean. Um, they have a, a pipe that runs out three miles offshore and uh, it, it, along with the water, it brings in a whole lot of fish, uh, fish uh, larva, fish uh, eggs, and other biota, other uh, organisms. And uh, they've been uh, trying to add up uh, the effects. So the first uh, chart here, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but the um, average uh, down at the bottom, um, and that is in millions of fish larvae. Um, these are not adult fish, but obviously hope to uh, grow into adult fish. And the uh, total uh, over this period of time they're studying was 269 million larvae. And you can see the individual uh, fish like winter flounder um, and uh, herring and uh, others that you may be familiar with. Um, some of these, of course, are commercial species and it's, it's certainly a, a, a loss to the uh, fishing industry as well as the environment as a whole. Um, on the second chart here, you can see the, uh, again, just a small sampling of uh, the fish they've studied um, and you're seeing thousands of fish um, every year uh, that are impinged. And that basically means they got caught in a uh, degrading <laughs> so they don't go into the plant itself. And again, you're seeing uh, huge numbers, 20,000 and some uh, every year um, that uh, again are being killed. They assume that anyone that's being entrained or impinged uh, will die uh, due to all the stresses of going down this tunnel. Um, so that's just one of the environmental impacts, but it was one that uh, uh, the EPA, when they were reviewing the environmental impact statement, thought was, uh, in their terminology, moderate to large an impact. It was the only uh, impact uh, on the environment that they determined to be large uh, for certain species like um, uh, the um, uh, rainbow herring and uh, one other one in particular. 
um, that you know are fished commercially. And they also determined that it, it uh, costs millions of dollars uh, in terms of lost um, product, if you will, uh, if these uh, fish were to be caught for human consumption. Now, moving on to accidents, um, of course, the, the, the worst one that we've uh, seen over many years is Chernobyl. It's just coming up on the 35th anniversary um, and uh, people are still dying from the exposure from Chernobyl. Um, it spread throughout Europe. I'll show you in a map in a second uh, showing that effect. Um, and they are still using plants very similar to Chernobyl uh, in Russia. I believe there are nine that are still operating. Um, they claim they fixed them and they aren't going to do what it did, um, but uh, it, it was certainly a, a horrendous uh, catastrophe for that region. This map you probably can't see terribly well, but uh, Chernobyl, Ukraine is right in the center here where these darker colors are. And uh, much of the pollution, the radiation traveled north um, and uh, east, I mean, excuse me, west, uh, uh, much towards Scandinavia, countries like Finland and uh, Sweden. Uh, Norway got uh, some of the worst impacts, even as far as Scotland, um, they were seeing high levels of radiation. And to this day, there are many uh, types of uh, plants and animals that it's not recommended to eat because of the ongoing radiation the fallout from Chernobyl. Um, and of course, the area right around the plant has been um, closed off for decades now and is, is a wasteland. Um, so this is an ongoing catastrophe. Um, and it's been determined by at least one researcher that is right on the ground in Russia, uh, passed on, but uh, uh, he and other researchers uh, totaled up all the, the cumulative effects um, of uh, Chernobyl, they determined that nearly 1 million people have died. Now the official reports you'll see out of the UN and other sources will maybe put it in the thousands. Some people say it's only a few dozen, uh, but clearly uh, there's been a much greater impact than was first uh, understood. And because of the, the uh, latency period of radiation of cancers, um, it could take many more decades before we know the, the full impact. Uh, moving on to Fukushima, um, we're coming up on the uh, 10th anniversary of, of that uh, catastrophe. Um, these are the four reactors of Fukushima Daiichi, um, and uh, th three of them, uh, in addition to melting down, had uh, uh, hydrogen explosions, uh, which caused the roofs to blow off. And um, we have an overhead close up here of the uh, reactor three. And you can see that the whole upper part of the reactor is just destroyed. Um, this blue spot in the center here uh, to the left is actually the spent fuel pool. Um, these type of reactors, um, much like um, Vermont Yankee, in fact, uh, the reactor pools are right in the reactor building itself. And when the roof blows off, the reactor pool is exposed. And this is a very serious uh, issue. It could have been much, much worse. Um, and for many years, we didn't know how bad it would really be. Um, but uh, I'll be saying a little more about spent fuel later. Um, but this is a side view of reactor four, which uh, also suffered an explosion. The spent fuel pool is up here. You can see some workers, uh, hopefully well uh, wrapped up in radiation suits, um, uh, trying to deal with the uh, problems there. They were concerned that the whole pool would spill over outside of the reactor, Let me go back. Um, and uh, it proved a very difficult problem. Um, and uh, fortunately, they have gotten that under control. Uh, but as you may know, Fukushima is an ongoing uh, disaster in terms of uh, continued uh, contaminated water and um, not really having a, a solution for cleaning up the mess. Um, one of the key issues with uh, any uh, nuclear reactor, and particularly after these accidents, is uh, how to get away from it when it, you know, <laughs> has a uh, an accident. Um, and so, uh, in its wisdom, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission determined that um, after Three Mile Island, that there should be a 10 mile radius of uh, evacuation planning. Um, this is the uh, Seabrook. Uh, 
neighborhood. Uh, this is uh, Kittery, Maine and Portsmouth up here and then Newburyport and other towns down here. And so there are, I think about 15 towns within the 10 mile radius of Seabrook in the center. And uh, these all had to have evacuation plans, uh, but due to the geography, the number of people involved and, and many other factors, um, it, it's very concerning that this uh, uh, evacuation plan may not really do the job. Um, now, at Fukushima, when they had the accident and determined how far the radiation traveled, it turned out that their evacuation planning, um, I believe 20 kilometers originally, wasn't adequate to deal with all the radiation. The brighter colors, you might guess, are where there's higher radiation effects. Um, and they found that uh, to the Northwest. Fortunately, it didn't blow to the Southeast because down here is Tokyo. Um, but uh, quite a bit of the countryside did get contaminated as well as the ocean, of course. And they determined that it, the um, evacuation planning needed to be a larger area. The US government uh, in its wisdom decided that folks, uh, you know, American citizens ought to get at least 50 miles away uh, from the, uh, uh, the accident. Um, and uh, it seems that if that was a good enough for Fukushima, it ought to be good enough for our country as well. Uh, but to, do, to this date, uh, no uh, US reactor has a 50 mile zone. This map shows if you were to expand that uh, evacuation zone uh, to 50 miles, it would extend almost to Portland, Maine and down uh, to uh, downtown Boston. So you can imagine it would be a much uh, more difficult problem. Uh, these figures up here show the numbers within the 10 mile radius, only 100,000 people 120,000, but 50 miles, you're talking 4.3 million people that would need to be uh, addressed in the evacuation. Um, so that's worth a whole other discussion itself, but it suffice to say it's a, it's a big problem and would certainly be a headache if there was a, a significant accident. Now, the other uh, big factor, as I mentioned before, is radioactive waste. Uh, this picture depicts the actual spent fuel pool uh, at Seabrook. Um, the water actually glows that blue color because of the radiation involved. And it has to be kept under 20 feet of water so that the radiation does not escape. The water absorbs it. It has to be kept cool. Uh, they have to keep pumping uh, water through it. Um, it has to be shielded. And again, the radiation, uh, the material is dangerous for tens of thousands of years. Um, now, a much better way of storing this radioactive material once it's cooled down a certain level is to put it into what they call dry cask storage. Um, these are very large casks, you've probably perhaps seen pictures of them, um, that uh, are dry in the sense they don't have liquid in them, uh, but they are sealed uh, uh, and they cool uh, through airflow. Um, they are retrievable in the sense that uh, if it was to be moved, you could, could move the material in them. Um, and they are safer certainly than being in these pools of water, um, as I mentioned. Um, it, it appears to be the best solution we have right now for storing this waste. Um, but uh, we and many environmental groups feel that there isn't adequate uh, protection. They need to be much hardened uh, structures to protect uh, these sites. And um, just to show what Seabrook's way spent fuel cast area looks like, this is a former parking lot uh, actually at the entrance of the plant. Um, and uh, there are about a dozen of these uh, mausoleum type structures that uh, uh, these vaults that the waste casts are put into. Uh, much more of the waste is still in the reactor building itself in the spent fuel pools. Uh, but eventually much more of it will be transferred to the site. As you can see, it's very open. There's just a chain link fence, concrete pad. It's, it's really open to the elements. Um, and uh, for security purposes, it's certainly not the best arrangement. Um, certainly uh, after 9-11, people are much more attuned to the idea that you, know, you could drop an airplane or a missile or something into that and it could cause a lot, a lot of problems. Um, and another point is that it is awfully close to the shoreline. This is the salt marsh in Seabrook, Hampton Harbor. 
Um, they say it's about 22, 23 feet above average sea level, mean sea level, but um, we don't think that's good enough. And certainly as sea level rises, um, that could be more of an issue. Um, just for comparison, uh, oh, and then this is a view of the, uh, these uh, vaults being delivered uh, on a barge. They're so big, they couldn't transport them over the highways. They had to bring them in by barge um, through uh, Hampton Harbor. So it gives you an idea of the scale involved. And uh, just for comparison, this is the main Yankee uh, storage site. Um, so we said the plant was shut down in 1996. They've been stored there for 25 years in these casks. There's about 550 tons of radioactive waste. Um, I believe it's at a somewhat higher elevation, but again, still open to the elements, just a chain link fence separating it. Um, and this is a map showing the transport routes. Uh, if the, the uh, spent fuel was to be sent to Yucca Mountain, that was the old plan. Uh, they sometimes refer to as the screw Nevada plan because Nevada didn't have a lot of votes in Congress and uh, they got stuck with it. Um, but that has been stalled. But in any case, um, environmentalists have referred to as this as the mobile Chernobyl plan uh, because of the potential for transporting this waste to uh, result in accidents. Um, there's routine radiation emitted from these casts. And of course, if they got into an accident, a fire, et cetera, um, you could have much more serious uh, complications. Um, and these are all the uh, nuclear reactors around the country, many in the Chicago area, the New York metropolitan area, and of course, New England. Um, that all would need to be shipped across the country. Um, there's kind of an interim plan right now to ship them to West Texas and uh, uh, Eastern New Mexico. Um, and that's a private operation, uh, but the federal government seems intent on moving it forward. Uh, we of course don't like that any better than the Yucca Mountain plan. Um, and it's again, only an interim solution uh, basically building a bigger parking lot to store the waste. Um, so this is certainly a problematic situation. And of course, the final solution, if you will, um, was intended to be Yucca Mountain. This is the entrance way. They spent billions of dollars building this uh, facility. Uh, and it's determined that there is uh, water seepage that uh, the um, uh, uh, site is uh, subject to uh, um, potential leakage um, and uh, they, they really don't uh, think, it, many people don't think it's a good solution uh, geologically, uh, let alone politically. Um, there is a alternate plan that was proposed about 25 years ago um, where they would store the waste in granite um, and being the granite state, New Hampshire, um, one of the sites was in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. There were also a couple of sites proposed in uh, uh, Eastern Maine on the um, Passamaquoddy um, and Penobscot Indian uh, lands. Um, they love to dump things on the Indians. I mean, that's just our history, of course. Um, fortunately, both of these proposals were uh, shot down, ran out of town, whatever. Um, and, uh, but they could resurface, obviously, with Yucca Mountain um, kind of kaput. And moving on to uh, climate disruption, um, again, uh, speaking of the impacts of climate on the plant itself, this map shows uh, Seabrook um, here where my pointer is, uh, just uh, west of Hampton Harbor, Hampton Seabrook, huge estuary. Um, as sea level rises, and it's predicted um, not even a worst case scenario now, uh, three feet or more, one meter uh, over the next hundred years, it could be as much as two meters and, and perhaps more. Um, we could see this whole area inundated, many of the approachways to the plant, including Route 1 here. Um, and uh, of course the coastal areas uh, would be affected. Hampton Beach itself uh, could disappear. Um, it is a barrier island, uh, so, you know, <laughs> Things change uh, when the climate changes. Um, and that could seriously affect the future of the nuclear plant, of course, and the, the waste stored there. Um, there's also concern about uh, more significant storms. You know, we could see a hurricane coming up our way or 
multiple storms, um, vegetation. Um, there are many different factors. And after Fukushima, um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission did require plants to look at some of these water regime changes, um, but um, they did not eventually require them to do it. They made uh, any changes voluntary we have now. Um, for its part, Seabrook came up with a plan that, were, that uh, called for certain uh, doors being reinforced to hold back the water and uh, the uh, pre-positioning of sandbags. Um, they, they, they're literally sandbagging the issue um, by uh, uh, saying that that would be a solution. Now, we get some idea of the effect of this by looking at uh, a plant out west. Uh, this is the Fort Calhoun plant in Nebraska. Back in 2011, the uh, Missouri River went over its banks, excuse me, and um, flooded the plant. And they thought it came within just a few feet of actually flowing into the reactor building itself. Um, it was a, a huge mess. Uh, they spent millions of dollars trying to reinforce and fix the plant afterward, but they eventually closed it down. So it's no longer operating. Um, but that is a, a problem when plants have to be close to water uh, to be able to uh, cool their, uh, their reactors. Um, just moving on to some economics, again, worthy of a whole other talk, uh, but uh, nuclear has proven to be not as economical as originally proposed. Uh, for new nuclear plants, this data is, is some, some 12 years old, it's a bit dated, uh, but uh, the uh, ISO New England, the group that follows the uh, that uh, plans the grid in, in New England uh, determined that, that nuclear was uh, uh, on the high end of uh, cost. If you were to build a new nuclear plant, that is um, uh, the only one higher was photovoltaics. We'll see in a minute how much they have come down in cost while nuclear has continued to go up. But you get a relative sense uh, of wind power, which we'll be talking about a lot in a few minutes, um, is uh, much cheaper, uh, particularly on, on land and uh, combined cycle gas, which is what many of our plants in New England and elsewhere have gone to, um, is, is cheaper still. Um, but obviously that is affected by the availability of gas. And so we'll see, as, uh, as you might guess, renewables have come on in a big way since then. Um, this is a comparison of uh, the cost of uh, solar, this uh, um, dark graph, excuse me. Um, the uh, dark line is the price of solar, and um, it has come down steadily, um, and it's come down even more since this was put together. Um, and uh, the price of nuclear, as I said, has gone up and up and up. And at some point, they cross paths, X marks the spot. That was in 2010. So for the last 10 years, on average, solar has been cheaper than nuclear. Um, so not surprisingly, they're not building many new nuclear plants. Um, this chart on the left shows the, uh, again, the price of solar coming down. Um, this is more recent data. It's actually come down as low as the price of uh, wind power, whereas nuclear has gone up in price. And then um, not surprisingly, uh, solar and other renewables have been increasing dramatically in recent years, whereas nuclear and of course coal have bottomed out we're actually, of course, seeing less nuclear now overall, um, certainly in the US, but even around the world. Um, so these are the trends that we're seeing, and it, it doesn't look good for nuclear, for sure. Um, so uh, we finally get to the, the solution. Uh, I refer to the four S's, sustainability, safety, security, and sanity. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of uh, coming up with sustainable sources. And fortunately, we have been seeing them coming on dramatically in recent years. Um, and, and we can also now project that uh, we will be able to run our whole uh, energy system uh, on renewable uh, sources uh, exclusively. Um, one project called the Solutions Project out of California determined that um, by 2050, we could be seeing the, the whole United States running on 100% uh, wind, water, and solar. Doesn't even include uh, biomass, you know, burning wood, which is an issue certainly in New Hampshire and Maine. Doesn't require huge batteries, uh, doesn't require new technology. 
obviously technology will improve, batteries will get built. Um, so uh, this is, I think, uh, a conservative approach. Um, and you can find these charts uh, on their website, solutionsproject.org. They have one for each state. Uh, so you can look up the one for Maine or New Hampshire or so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a projection. It's obviously not the, the uh, ultimate solution, but it gives you a sense of what the potential is. Um, I just point out that wind power uh, in the main one, I believe they have 35% for each. So most of Maine's power could come from wind and uh, m most of that, at least half of that from offshore wind. I think it'll probably be even more than that. Um, but that certainly is a big factor for New England and uh, where we should be heading. And of course, we need to connect up the grid better to have a smarter grid uh, in which all these different sources can be maintained and uh, uh, coordinated. Um, and models have been developed to do this with computers. We can do a much better job of uh, getting these sources uh, to uh, work together. Um, and you can even involve, uh, you know, uh, household solar, uh, uh, car batteries, uh, all kinds of facilities can be plugged into the grid so that um, you could have a, a much more resilient, much more diverse uh, grid. Again, another big topic, but just briefly, that's where we need to go. So um, New Hampshire, I mean, Maine actually kind of led the way in what got me interested in this topic. Um, they uh, put together a task force uh, called by the governor back in 2008 and they uh, produced this report um, in 2009 that uh, determined that there was a huge potential for offshore wind in particular. Um, and that uh, they uh, thought that 5,000 megawatts, which is more than double the current use of uh, electric power in, in Maine, enough to run basically both Maine and New Hampshire, um, could be uh, developed by 2030. Um, as you might guess that, uh, target has been shifted somewhat um, because of politics. Uh, a certain governor um, stood in the way of much of this development for several years, um, but it is getting back on track, as you'll see in a minute. Um, when this report came out, it, it definitely uh, piqued my interest um, because uh, one of the researchers announced that there was enough power offshore of uh, Maine uh, through wind power to um, replace uh, 150 nuclear plants. And that sounded pretty good to me. You know, we only have 100 in the country, so you could replace a whole lot of coal plants as well. Um, and so that's pretty intriguing, and we'll see why that's the case. Um, and this plan also determined that uh, between onshore and offshore wind and other renewable sources, we could uh, run the whole state of Maine, including switching over transportation to all electric. Uh, home heating to all electric um, or uh, heat pumps and uh, run the whole state and even have some left over to uh, export to other states. Now, of course, state of Maine and other New England states are all on one grid, so it isn't like it's all going to stay in Maine in any case. But the point is that there is a uh, potential uh, resource to be able to do that. Um, at about the same time, the U.S. Department of Energy put out a, a report for the whole country that determined that there were thousands, tens of thousands of megawatts in offshore wind available. This was a real groundbreaking report in, in really showing uh, how things could look and that the uh, potential uh, was so huge. Even off of New Hampshire with our tiny little coast, um, there were uh, about 2,000 megawatts. And they determined in a subsequent report that it would be even economically feasible, not just, you know, theoretically, um, uh, just in our short coastline, as we'll see in a minute here. Um, so here's a map of the entire US. The brighter colors, you might guess, are the areas offshore that are um, best for wind. Uh, it turns out the northern latitudes are much better for wind, the northeast and the northwest. Um, and most of the whole interior of the US is actually much less uh, uh, productive for wind. There's just one area in uh, southeastern Wyoming that is even comparable to most of the areas offshore, just 10, 20 miles offshore. Um, and so it really behooves us to tap into this offshore resource. And of course, most of the people live on the coast, east coast and west coast as well. Um, so it, it just has huge, huge potential. 
Um, and since those reports were uh, developed, um, the uh, organization, the federal agency, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, BOEM, has uh, identified lease sites for offshore wind. Um, one of the most significant, of course, just south of the Cape, uh, here uh, south of Martha's Vineyard, uh, a little closer input uh, inset here on that site. And um, all of the New England states that are looking to tap into offshore wind currently uh, are utilizing this one area um, south of the Cape. And so that's, uh, you know, really huge game changer for our region. Um, and of course, all the other New England states or all the other Eastern East Coast states, except for Maine and New Hampshire and uh, Georgia uh, have looked into offshore wind, have either identified a site or done research, set up a task force. Um, according to uh, BOEM regulations, uh, each state uh, or region has to put together a task force that would involve all the local, state, tribal, and federal agencies involved uh, to sort out the different the issues and, and get a better sense of what's feasible. Um, so that's been a really important process. And I'm happy to say that New Hampshire and Maine uh, just in the last two years agreed to uh, have a task force and they held a meeting last year. Uh, with COVID, of course, things have been delayed as far as up, up, uh, upcoming meetings, um, but uh, it, it was a big step forward to get the states to, to sign on to this process. Um, and as I was saying, for all of New England, we've seen a huge increase in um, uh, proposals uh, it turns out that just offshore wind alone is now over 13,000 megawatts. That's about half of the total peak uh, capacity of New England, uh, the new, whole New England grid um, that could be uh, gotten from offshore wind if all these proposals go forward. It's not clear that all of them will get built, um, but a significant number are. And it's been really uh, driven by states procuring, requiring that their uh, utilities purchase a certain amount of power with Massachusetts, of course, leading the way with uh, several thousand megawatts already procured. Um, and so uh, what the ISO New England uh, regional grid is seeing this huge number of uh, offshore wind uh, development, 68% uh, uh, of its total new capacity is looking to come from wind and most of that from offshore. Um, I, I do note that there's quite a bit also being proposed in Maine, and I'm sure people have issues with some of those onshore sites. Um, but again, offshore is proving to be a much better solution and much uh, larger potential. Just to give you an idea of what the available area, this is the 50 mile zone out to here from the coast of Maine. Um, the, as you might guess, the areas in darker color are uh, higher potential. Um, the uh, uh, Department of Energy, I believe, determines red is excellent <laughs> and uh, orange is very good. Uh, but any, anywhere in this area would be good for offshore wind. And Maine is particularly good in that uh, much of this uh, best area is within uh, 10 to 20 miles, even closer to the coast, although they'll certainly try to limit that um, being too close to the shore. Now, New Hampshire has a different picture. This is much bigger scale. Um, this is Portsmouth down to uh, Seabrook down here. Um, and we have this odd little pie, pie slice of land that is actually in the state um, uh, waters, if you will. Now, three miles offshore, this, this green line here is actually what's uh, federal waters uh, more than three miles. And that means that um, the federal agencies really call the shots if you're more than three miles out, whether you're in Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. Uh, so much, most of the Gulf of Maine, most of the areas that would be developed are going to be done in federal waters by these regulated by the federal agencies. But even in New Hampshire's very small little slice of, of uh, offshore real estate, it's been determined that there's about 2,000 megawatts. That's more than Seabrook uh, as capacity at 1,250 megawatts. Um, so, you know, we could see potentially enough wind power just off our shores to replace Seabrook alone, let alone all these others uh, being developed. 
Um, as of today, of course, we only have one wind farm off our coast. You've probably heard about the Block Island wind farm, just five turbines, uh, 30 megawatts. Uh, but it, it certainly set a uh, good precedent for moving forward on offshore wind. Um, and you can now get tours of the site uh, because it's become a tourist attraction. Um, the Gulf of Maine, uh, we've had a uh, very interesting uh, research project by the University of Maine you may be familiar with uh, called Voltern US. Uh, this was a one eighth scale uh, uh, a uh, floating turbine that was set up in uh, Penobscot Bay off of Castine. And it ran for, I believe, a year and a half uh, generating electricity. It uh, withstood a, uh, a major nor'easter storm. Uh, and you can actually watch a video on their website of uh, how well it, it uh, how stable it was in the water. Um, again, this is a floating system, which appears in Maine uh, and New Hampshire to be the main way to go, if you will, um, for uh, offshore wind because the waters are too deep generally, unless you want to be really close to shore, which nobody wants them real close to shore. Um, so floating systems are going to be the future. Um, and they are testing a full scale model, uh, I think in the next couple of years is the target now um, off of Monhegan Island, just south of Monhegan. Uh, it's again within state waters, so they don't have the feds to deal with. Um, but uh, this is a, uh, uh, a drawing of what that uh, turbine will look like. It'll be 10 to 12 megawatts uh, in one turbine. And we'll see in a minute how large these turbines are getting to be. Um, and I should mention the state of Maine is uh, the state government has announced an intention to build a actual wind farm of uh, about, a, about a dozen turbines as the next step and to have it up and running by 2025. Um, and that would be kind of a research facility to determine the best way to go about doing these floating farms. Um, but we have a lot of uh, previous uh, results to go on in that other countries have developed these offshore uh, floating turbines. Um, this one was built in Norway. It's on a single uh, 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 spar, I guess it's called, um, that floats under, under the water. Um, this one is by a company in, um, sorry about the jumping around, um, a uh, company out of uh, uh, Seattle, Washington, actually, Principal Power, but it was built by a Spanish uh, company um, and is, or, uh, excuse me, Portuguese, <laughs> and it's offshore of Portugal. And then the last one here, uh, very interestingly, was built by the Japanese. It's a seven megawatt turbine, and it was uh, placed off of Fukushima, um, not coincidentally. I think the Japanese have kind of learned their lesson, or at least they're realizing that they really need to go with uh, uh, renewable sources in the future. And they've proposed many uh, thousands of megawatts of, of offshore wind, uh, of course, to replace their nuclear plants as well as uh, oil and coal plants. Um, so that's a good start on that technology. And then we're seeing these much larger turbines being built. Um, the largest to date is the uh, 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 Haleade uh, X uh, turbine that's built by GE, General Electric. You know, they're uh, <laughs> doing good things. Uh, they also built a lot of nuke plants in their previous life, um, including actually the Fukushima plant was a GE model, um, but they're getting much bigger into offshore wind. And this one is a 12 megawatt turbine. Uh, you might notice it's onshore, uh, but it's just a prototype to, uh, you know, test out the technology. Um, the uh, next ones will be offshore in the next couple of years. And they're now saying they can uh, have, they can rate it up to 14 megawatts. And um, basically the sky's the limit. I mean, these are uh, 800 feet tall. Uh, they have this huge uh, rotor span. Um, this other one is a Vestas uh, plant that's about 10 megawatts and um, others are developing large ones as well. So we're seeing just much, much greater capacities and that bodes well for the future offshore wind. Um, I, I do wanna mention since uh, Peace Action Maine is one of the co-sponsors of this event. And again, another reason I got involved with the offshore wind issue uh, is the fact that uh, uh, the uh, Ports of Naval Shipyard is a strategic location right smack in the middle of Portsmouth Harbor um, that could potentially be uh, utilized 
uh, for offshore wind development. Um, and uh, somewhat surprisingly, the, the uh, folks that run the shipyard have actually uh, offered to provide some of their facilities, at least for research and, and construction purposes um, uh, to uh, folks like the University of New Hampshire. Um, I don't believe they've taken them up on it yet, but potentially we could see parts of the shipyard being utilized for this purpose. Um, obviously has very easy access to the open ocean and deep water. Um, they have dry dock facilities and warehouses and so forth. Um, and as a peacenik, I would certainly like to see um, the shipyard in the future being used for something more peaceful, something more useful uh, than weapons of mass destruction. Um, and so uh, we'll see if that happens. But um, a commission that was set up uh, by the New Hampshire legislature recently uh, is charged with determining what role the shipyard could play in uh, offshore wind development. So stay tuned, that may, uh, may develop over time. So uh, getting back to nuclear, uh, we have to ask whether uh, the sun is setting <laughs> on uh, uh, Seabrook and nuclear power in general. Um, as I've said, the economics and uh, the politics are not working out well for it, despite the best efforts of uh, state and federal agencies to prop them up uh, with, with huge subsidies. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which I haven't said much about, but they're uh, one of the best examples of what's called a captured regulator. Uh, they are actually funded by the nuclear industry by fees they charge to the nuclear uh, uh, plants. And um, they have uh, shown no uh, real independence as far as um, determining whether nuclear is safe and sustainable for the future. Um, some of you may know the uh, book, uh, um, The Confessions of a uh, uh, um, Nuclear Regulator uh, by uh, um, a former uh, NRC uh, chairman. Uh, we had him speak up uh, this way uh, last year and it's well worth reading a real inside story on um, how the NRC operates and how it uh, really mismanages the situation from a regulatory standpoint. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's kind of the picture as we see it from here on the our sea coast. And um, again, offshore wind, other uh, renewable resources uh, do promise a, a new age in uh, energy production and hopefully a much more benign uh, future for our region and for the world. Um, so I think I'll stop there. Um, just pointing out that uh, we need to continue engaging our state and federal uh, local officials to make this happen. Um, Maine, as, in, in, as well as New Hampshire, need to get on the ball with uh, requiring that uh, offshore wind and other renewable resources get built. And we need to be working together to make sure we have the best plan going forward. Um, and uh, there is a regional coalition that's uh, just coming together in the last year or so called Doug, we lost you. Are you back again, Doug? Doug, you want to try to cut your video feed and see if we can get your audio back? Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid we lost Doug and I'm not sure. We'll see if he can come back in. And for those people who might have questions, if, if we get Doug back into the room, soon we'll be able to answer those questions. If he's got offline for any reason, we can collect the, the questions and have them answered offline. Yeah, hey, Martha, just while we're waiting for Doug, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, just wanted to thank you again and thank Arthur for <clears throat> managing the questions and for putting this on technically and, and offering us uh, the, the opportunity in Peace Action Maine and, of course, Doug. Um, and um, 
yeah, I think someone asked a question, but this is being recorded. In theory, I'm doing it. In theory, you're doing it. And in theory, it'll be up on our Friends of Mary Meeting Bay website in a speaker series recording section at some point here. And I, I'll thank Martin McDonough for helping make that possible. He's on here as well. So um, we'll see what we'll see how the rest of it works. And I think that was a great talk. I hope Doug can come back. I'm not sure what happened either. So. Um, Hi, I'm just wondering if I could just say hello to the group. Um, I'm Sarah Dunmez um, from Dublin, New Hampshire, and I'm on the board of C10, which is the organization that Doug referred to um, that has been involved in um, working very closely through the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Atomic um, Safety and Licensing Board to try to ensure that adequate um, attention is being paid to the concrete degradation of the Seabrook nuclear power plant. Um, and we did manage to get um, a, a lot of um, additional attention and regulations placed on next era for monitoring the concrete degradation. But since that's been one of C10's major um, focuses recently, I do just want to let you know that that is a very um, acute situation and one that is irreversible. Um, so the concrete is going is um, going to continue to degrade and um, the micro cracking that it leads to is pervasive throughout the plant. It's in the spent fuel pool as well as in the container dome and you know really it really the plant is riddled with um this concrete degradation and i guess i just also wanted to let you know on um, that um this work is really important because um Seabrook is the first and only um, nuclear power plant in the nation known to have ASR. We assume that it is present in many of the other um, nuclear power plants as well. It's a very common condition in roadways and in bridges. Um, and it's known to have occurred in a couple of other nuclear plants overseas, which led to their closure. Um, so we think that this may also be um, uh, you know, we hope that this is a step toward regulations that would apply to um, all of the nuclear fleet in the um, in the nation and lead to additional scrutiny for other nuclear power plants. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, um, c10.org, um, and we'd welcome any of your questions um, or participation in any of our events. So thanks so much for putting this on. I learned a lot. I'm very hopeful at the wind um, that Doug has presented and I'm just grateful to you for putting on this talk tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank Sarah, you. Sarah, can you identify, is that C10? How is that spelled? Can you enter that yeah, into the chat? Yeah, I'll put that in the chat, absolutely. Sarah, have there been any life expectancy uh, conclusions that have come out of the, the ASR issue? That you know, might. that's such an interesting question, um, trying to project the future of it. Um, not really, okay. not really. We've had the great good luck to work with um, an expert in this field for, who's um, a, a professor at UC Boulder. His name is Victor Salma, um, um, but it is has not, I mean, life expectancy implies that, that that it would get the cracking would be so bad that they'd have to shut it down. And of course, that's been our big question too, is, you know, <laughs> what is that point? Um, and needless to say, the NRC hasn't been interested in trying to project that or ask Next Era to project that. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we know that for sure, no. Okay, thank you. I've got three people in a stack. It looks like Vance, Rick, and Paul. Did you have a question, Paul Kane? Well, I, I don't hear Paul right now. I get so go ahead, Rick, and then uh, Vance first, and then Rick. Well, uh, hello, uh, Rick Maynard, Manchester, New Hampshire, IBW uh, electrician, uh, nuclear certified electrician, and I actually worked on Seabrook recently, where we took and uh, elevated the main main breaker, and uh, the underground piping going up to that. Uh, the main breaker for the, or connecting the plant to the grid, they put it about 15 feet up in the air. Uh, all the underground piping, leaving the control center at, to that main breaker was 
really deteriorated to the point that you couldn't guarantee We just lost your sound, Rick. Well, the uh, host muted me. Oh. So uh, basically, that's what I'm just saying. Worse than the concrete is the underground piping and the metallic piping connecting to all the objects in the electrical system is what determines your grounding and your feedback mechanism for or overcurrent protection. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there was uh, where they connected to the metal troughs where the pipes came in underneath, they were totally not connected. If they, if they touched, it was by accident. <laughs> yeah, so the more current, the more galvanic corrosion that's happening there. Yeah. So Vance, looks like you're next, Vance. Okay, well, uh, if Don's not on, I was just going to ask a question of, you know, there, there always seems to be some, you know, some complaint about any renewable proposal. And I didn't know if, if Doug was aware of any, you know, potential objections to, to offshore wind. So um, if, if he heard that or <laughs> he gets back, I'd be interested in his response. And I will, uh, just on this topic, doesn't come up often, but um, I actually grew up very near Three Mile Island and I got three days, my senior year in high school, because we all had to stay indoors, I got three days off of school from that. <laughs> so that's really interesting, Vance. I think what we'll do is try to relay these, the questions to Doug and when he has a chance, he'll answer us and then we'll try to get the answers shared back onto wherever we post the film. Is that okay? Oh, yeah. here's Doug. Oh, <laughs> you wanna yeah. ask it again? Here's Doug. Martha, have you tried to call Doug? He's back. He's, he's, back he's coming on. right now. Sort of. He's in, I don't know if you have to do something to get him out of the waiting room, Martha. Uh, he's joining now. It just takes a little. Yeah. Okay. You there, Doug? Martha. Uh, I could offer a comment about um, Maine Yankee. Uh, one, one minute here, here's here's Doug. So you can go ahead, Rob, about your Maine Yankee. Oh, I was gonna say, when I was hearing about the size of the uh, emergency evacuation plans, you know, considering uh, 10 miles, 20 miles, 50 miles, uh, Maine Yankee was, um, had a six mile radius that was pretty much standard industry at that time. Um, in the summer of, I think, 1976, I spent the whole summer um, going around interviewing all the boards of selectmen of all the towns, uh, the hospital administrators, the Coast Guard, uh, the state police, and anyone, and, this, and at that time what they were called the civil defense officers, to find out what they knew about the emergency evacuation plan for Maine Yankee. And um, the answer was a resounding uh, amount of silence because although this plan existed on paper, none of the local municipal officials or people that play a role in the event of an accident um, had any clue that there was even a plan or that they had any role in it. Um, as a result of, of that report, w working with Ralph Nader and uh, Public Citizen, we filed a, uh, a show cause petition with the NRC to shut down Maine Yankee on the basis that it had um, no effective emergency evacuation plan. And um, of course, it didn't get anywhere with the NRC. But then we proceeded with the State Public Utilities Commission uh, on the basis that Maine required um, safe and dependable service and argued that 
uh, Main Yankee without an effective plan was not safe. Um, and thereupon began a process where they started installing sirens. And you may recall if you were around Wiscasset before the plant shut down, there were a lot of uh, big uh, horns set up on very tall telephone poles in some of those surrounding communities, all of which was uh, designed to alert people if there was an accident. And um, I don't, whether or not they knew where to go, I don't know, because you, you know, with the main coastline in, in that area, it's very jagged and uh, there aren't a lot of straight, straight routes from A to B. But um, so the fact that they've expanded out from what Doug said to larger uh, safety zones uh, is a good thing, but it certainly complicates the idea of evacuating anybody. Sorry to get cut off, folks. Uh, <laughs> I had to reboot my computer. It always seems to take quite a while, but uh, I, I trust everybody saw my last slide or got to see all the, all the presentation. The sunset, sunset slide, was that? Yeah, I had one couple more, um, mainly just with websites and such. No. Uh, at the end, I can nope. put that up if folks want to see that, that information. That would be good. The sunset slide was the last one we saw. Um, we do have an outstanding question from Vance, which, which was about possible environmental issues with offshore wind, if you wanted to speak to some of those. Sure. Well, and then, uh, Doug, when you got cut off, um, you were just starting to say a coalition is now forming? Yes. Okay. Well, that's a good segue. Um, can folks see this now? Yep. Yes. Okay, good. Go. Um, yeah, so um, yes, there's a, a coalition uh, throughout New England called New England for Offshore Wind. Um, and it includes um, many national and regional groups, uh, as well as some from state of Maine, like Natural Resource Council, Maine, Maine Conservation Voters, University of Maine, um, SAPL is on board, uh, and dozens of more groups. Um, so if you go to their website, newenglandforoffshorewind.org, uh, it's listed down at the bottom there, um, you should be able to uh, read more about it and uh, your group could join it, um, and uh, you know, more the merrier. Um, there's going to need to be a big effort to push, you know, given that uh, the existing proposals have been getting some flack. I didn't get into all that, but if you could imagine the fishing industry is uh, pushing back, and there have been some uh, squabbles over the, the actual layout of these, these new wind farms. And of course, if you have questions, uh, uh, other things you'd like to uh, contact me for, um, we have our uh, office phone number as well as my uh, email. Uh, email is probably more uh, immediate direct for me uh, if you want an answer quickly, um, but uh, be glad to uh, stay in touch with people. Um, but I'd be glad to take other questions now. So there was a question, Doug, from Vance about wildlife effects or environmental effects, and if you could speak to any of those possible issues with offshore wind. Well, I did try to touch on some of that. Um, oh, with offshore wind, yes. as opposed to the nuclear. Yeah. yeah. Birds, um, birds, bats, fish, you know. Yeah, and, and that's one reason I, I like to point out that groups like National Wildlife Federation, also Audubon, have uh, signed on to offshore wind uh, because uh, it's it's pretty well thought that the um, uh, potential impacts uh, to marine uh, life uh, in the ocean is much, much lower than what we find in terrestrial settings. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, you can cite them in areas that are going to be less uh, impactful to begin with, you know, not on the flyways of birds and so forth. But it turns out that most of the offshore area, you know, more than 10, 15 miles out, um, you don't see a lot of uh, bird life in particular. They like to stay close to shore. Um, certainly we need to be concerned about the right whales in particular, endangered species. Um, but um, most environmental groups feel that this uh, is uh, doable, that we can work out the differences. And that's one of the reasons, I don't know if I got to it yet in my uh, last few comments, but the state of Maine has been uh, proposing to build a 
kind of a research wind farm of about a dozen turbines. And part of the reason there would be to determine the impacts on fisheries and wildlife and so forth. So, um, you know, there has been a lot of research already, but uh, certainly Europe is way ahead of us on all this. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think in, in New England and around the country, people are very sensitive to the impacts. And uh, again, much lower than the impacts from other sources. Uh, in my regular slideshow on offshore wind, I have a chart that shows the magnitude of difference in impacts from uh, power lines to uh, uh, buildings, just windows, you know, <laughs> and of course, domestic cats are a huge source of uh, 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 mortality among birds. Um, and so, you know, I'm a cat lover too, so I don't wanna blame the cats, but <laughs> when you look at the scale of the, the impacts, uh, offshore wind and, and onshore wind are, are much lower in terms of total mortality. And um, it's getting better and better. They're developing techniques in order to scare off the birds, if you will, and bats, other creatures. Um, and also the larger the turbine, it turns out they move slower. You know, it's not like a big Cuisinart in the air. It's a very slow process. And it's thought that, you know, most of the birds will be able to adapt uh, to that, uh, you know, change in regime. It's not like having a large concrete wall a thousand feet in the air that you got to run into and don't have much choice in the matter. Um, so anyway, that that's generally the thinking on on wildlife impacts. I guess Steve Pelletier, one of our members, just popped up something on the chat, but he's done a, a lot of this work for quite a few years now and certainly can welcome to welcome to jump in steve if you want to say anything about insects or or bats um uh, yeah. i'm not sure can you can you hear me all right yes yeah. um yeah by by chance we've um over the number of years we we've, we've done quite a bit of work on offshore bats just after doing a lot of studies on terrestrial wind power sites for birds and bats and that meant a lot of just everything from uh, involving um, radar and acoustic studies and a lot of uh, post um, construction sites where you're actually walking around underneath turbines. And so the idea of trying to understand what kind of fatalities, what kind of risk were offshores been a huge problem for both the Department of Energy and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Um, Department of Energy gave us a, a, a substantive, substantial grant back a number of years ago where we conducted studies up and down the coast, actually from just about shy of Canada all the way down to, to um, North Carolina, where in that particular study, we were looking for um, uh, the influence of migrating bats. Um, it's, and that was following a lot of different, different types of avian studies. Um, so the, sh the short, answer here is we, we were actually ended up being contracted to conduct the first offshore studies at uh, Bureau, at uh, Block Island. So that was conducted for about um, th four years where we've got both uh, radar and um, let, me, let me see if I can do this right here. I'll put this up, start video. So, so long and short is we ended up putting um, uh, both uh, uh, different types of radar and um, cameras, thermal and, and regular cameras and acoustic uh, um, recorders on, on a couple of the turbines out on Block Island. And so, you know, as predicted, there are seasonal times for bats that they're coming through. It's during migration, mostly it's in that uh, um, late uh, late July, mid-July through mid-September period where most bats are migrating through. And you'll get quite a few numbers out there, even quite a distance. And, and Block Island is, is only a couple of miles off, of, off the island. And we were getting plenty of bats out there. There's plenty of bats much, much farther out offshore. The risk is, is generally limited because of the timing. Um, and, and, but there is some risk. And one of the concerns that you would have though, is that some of these turbines, and if you're talking about some of these turbines that are getting to be like 15 megawatt turbines and they're getting pretty high and they're reaching higher and their rotor swept zone is, is much larger. Um, 
frankly, you know, the trade-off is it's a much better energy source in the end of the day than uh, just about anything else we've got available to us. Um, and there was going to be some kind of risk, some kind of cost, no matter what we do, unless we decide just to turn things all off, which nobody seems to be interested in doing. Um, so when you look at the big trade-offs, there are risks, but some of those risks can be actually minimized by, by um, knowing, by understanding how those birds and bats are moving at certain times of the year, because they're only gonna be moving under certain wind speeds, under certain conditions, at certain seasonal times. And you start adding these things up and you can really minimize the risk by curtailing your, your turbines. You don't have to do it for long periods of time. There's, there's a number of things we're doing if we're only become a little bit more smarter and, and, and uh, actually spend a little bit more time looking to see when these critters are around and, and we can even do this do this job better. So I just want to say, Doug, you did an excellent talk. You're on, everything's on the right thing. I've gotten into the weeds on this stuff for quite some time. So it's, it's nice to see another advocate for it. So. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I figure there's a lot of folks in Maine have been doing a lot of work because this has been progressing for many years and you know, notably the University of uh, Maine. Um, so I'm glad to hear that folks are uh, we actually, we had, we'd actually put the uh, acoustic um, detectors out on on uh, the not only a casting but on that that floating uh, one eighth model, you know. And again, it, no big surprises because bats are even with white nail with uh, white nose syndrome and, and a number of reduced bats. There's still quite a few bats that are out there, and you know, um, but. It's interesting that the agencies have kind of just moved away. And I don't know if it was just the last couple of administrations that have been looking at, but it doesn't seem to be, you know, as much of a risk. Right whales are, are rightfully um, a huge concern still, though. I'll take enough time. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yard, are you up next? Do you have some time for your comments? Sorry, I didn't catch that. I'm, look, I'm looking for Yarda. She had a comment in the Yarda Hutar. Yeah, I just uh, thought that uh, the coalition between the Maine and New Hampshire is absolutely necessary for both the power station and the shipyard. Yeah, we're really glad to see the, um, it's really the, the Federal Bureau. I mean, hard to believe they actually are getting something right on the federal level, uh, despite, you know, Trump administration. Um, but, uh, you know, even there, they, they realize that offshore wind is a huge uh, potential. It's part of the, you know, all of the above uh, approach. And, and they're also seeing that regional uh, cooperation is, is certainly key. And we, we saw that certainly with the Cape. Um, and uh, um, it, it bodes well for the Gulf of Maine that, that obviously the three states should work together and that they're, you know, literally all in the same room. Um, remains to be seen, you know, if there's specific facilities and which states are going to get more connections. Uh, but, you know, uh, we, we do have uh, the infrastructure out there to be able to, to do much more. And, and I think we'll be seeing some rapid development uh, in coming years. Wonderful. I, I think that we're about to close down the meeting and let the, unless there are any other questions. Ed, do you have any final comments? Thank yeah. you, Doug. Yeah, I think I think I was going to say we should close it out soon because people are drifting off and, 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 and we've been on the air for a while. So Doug, you were off the air when I thanked you, but uh, it's been a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, it will get up on uh, on our website. Thank Martha and Arthur again, and everyone who came. We really appreciate it. I think it went really well. Um, and uh, yeah, check the website. I don't know uh, within a week or so, and hopefully it'll be there. And uh, great slides. And again, it was wonderful. Um, so thank thank you, and, and hope to see you next month with the rainbow smelt. Mm -hmm. Which I noticed came up on your one of your slides as uh, being sucked into yes. the uh, nuclear <laughs> inferno there. Yeah.